Well, hello. My name is Angel Wood, and this is Crime of the Truest Kind. Welcome back to the show. We are full on, full on, full on holidaying now, aren't we? It is December. Rolling out episode number 36. Thanks for coming back. My name is Angel Wood. This is Crime of the Truest Kind, New England Crime Stories. I really enjoy doing it. And thank you for listening to the show, supporting the show, telling other people about the show. That's very important. Thank you, Patreon supporters, Total Gems, Sandy with an I, and Pat from New Hampshire, and superstar honorary producer, Lisa MC, I will maintain your anonymity, and our latest supporter, John F. Left the show a tip in the tip jar, buying the dogs a bone, as I like to say, or a coffee. Whatever you think your money is going to, I want that to be what you believe. Neither of which would be wrong. And John F. also left a lovely Apple podcast review. So sweet. I love it. Oh, and John F. also sent in some great case ideas, which happened to be on my list, my very long list of case ideas. But when you suggest things, I bump those up closer to the top of the list. So send me your ideas. I do love them. Lots of true crime news this week. The Peacock docuseries, I Felt Your Rage. Casey Anthony is a pathological liar. Done and done. We will not talk about it anymore. There are a lot of New England true crime headlines. Here in Massachusetts, police in Marshfield are hoping the public can help them find the man who is a suspect in a grisly murder of a couple there. Christopher Keeley, 27, of Weymouth, is wanted for killing Carl Matson, 70, and his wife Vicki Matson, who would have turned 71 on Wednesday. The two had been found dead in their home by officers who were sent to do a wellness check. Now, Keeley is on the run in a 2019 black Jeep Wrangler Unlimited, Massachusetts plates 7490HT. I think by now he's probably dumped that car, but catch that fucker. There was a grim discovery in Southie. Police in South Boston discovered the remains of four infants in an apartment there. On the afternoon of Thursday, November 17th, officers responded to a radio call to investigate a residence at 838 East Broadway. All told, homicide detectives located the remains of four fetuses in a freezer on the premises. Ugh. A post-mortem examination was performed on two infant males and two infant females, and the results of the autopsies remain pending. It is an open and active investigation. Last episode, episode 35, we walked through the story of the Lady of the Dunes in Provincetown, Massachusetts. An unsolved mystery in the state of Massachusetts for over 48 years. Well, we now know, we learned on Halloween Day, that she is Ruth Marie Terry. We don't know how she got to Massachusetts. We don't know her story yet. But I hope that one day we will. And in researching that story, well, that opened up a whole can of worms for your friend Angel, because I never stopped digging. I learned about a woman named Roy Jean Kessinger, and that led me to this week's episode. Well, we will talk about Rory Jean Kessinger of Pembroke, Mass. Beginning today... We are going to start digging into the cases of the missing, unsolved, and unclaimed of New England, starting in Massachusetts. I only recently learned about Rory Jean Kessinger. In the previous episode, I covered the case of the long, unidentified Lady of the Dunes, who after 48 years was finally given her identity back. It was theorized by police that Rory Jean Kessinger resembled the woman found murdered on Provincetown in the summer of 1974. And Rory is among the 174 open cases of missing persons in Massachusetts right now. That's according to NAMUS statistics, N-A-M-U-S, National Missing and Unidentified Persons System. It is a national information clearinghouse and resource center 
for missing, unidentified, and unclaimed person cases across the U.S. A surprising stat I learned, according to the World Population Review state rankings, the state with the lowest rate of missing persons is Massachusetts. At 2.3 missing persons per 100,000. While Rhode Island, the smallest state, has the smallest number of missing persons in absolute terms at 29. Let's put the numbers into some perspective. Missing persons in all states and territories open cases are at 22,460 as I say this to you right now. Unidentified persons, 14,311 open cases and unclaimed persons in all states and territories totals 15,212. In Massachusetts, 174 open missing persons cases, 199 unidentified persons, and 525 unclaimed person cases, according to NamUs, right now. These numbers are staggering because one is too many. I think what might sadden me the most is the term unclaimed persons. Like Lady of the Dunes for 48 years. I found this great piece by uh, WWPL out of Western Mass, Agawam area. I think we would all like to believe that when we finally leave this mortal coil, that we will be remembered and probably eulogized on Facebook and hopefully not with some wretched photo someone took of you that you hate, but rather that we will be mourned with a group of our nearest and dearest friends as they grieve and laugh and tell stories about how funny and wonderful that we really were. Maybe not that we lit up a room because I think I have an unintended resting bitch face or that I did not give you the shirt off my back because that would be weird. And I really need my shirt, but I will help you in any way that I can. But according to the story, Worcester funeral director Peter Steffen is at the forefront of a growing problem, burying hundreds of people who die every year with no family and no money. They are referred to as unclaimed, like baggage, a label for someone who dies without family or whose family waives any claim to them. The thought of someone missing and no one is looking, or if someone knows that their loved one has died and they just leave them behind. That's very sad to me. Unclaimed bodies are treated as indigent. That's how someone who has died in poverty is labeled, like a pauper's grave, right? This piece came out in 2018. So going back a previous year, Stefan said how he buried between 40 and 50 unclaimed bodies. And not all of these unclaimed bodies are unidentified. Some of them have names attached. They have no money or no family, he said he had as many as nine unclaimed bodies in one week. The medical examiner's office must hold unclaimed bodies until they find a funeral director willing to pick them up. If the office cannot identify a body, cannot find the next of kin, or the next of kin waives all claims to the body, then they turn it over to the Department of Transitional Assistance, or the DTA. I recently watched a documentary about this called A Certain Kind of Death. It really gives you a raw and unfiltered account of what happens to people when they die with no next of kin. You get it all. Dead bodies in various stages of decomp, it's very clinical, not for shock value at all. You see the process from the discovery of the body to the final disposition of the remains and each step in between. There are people whose job it is to identify these people, to try to, try to piece their lives together and to contact their next of kin if they have any. You can find it on YouTube. It's called A Certain Kind of Death. It is linked on the Crime of the Truest Kind YouTube channel. And of course, I will put it in the show notes and on the webpage. Now, according to data that WWPL obtained from the Department of Public Safety, the Office of the Medical Examiner referred as many as 85 bodies per year from 2014 to 2017. Stefan said that DTA reimburses funeral directors $1,100 for indigent burials, 
But in order to qualify for the reimbursement, they can't spend more than $3,500, which barely covers the cost of even a basic burial. It costs approximately up to $3,000 to bury a body. And if you're indigent, no one is going to pay that $3,000. However, if you are indigent, you would be cremated for $500. So yes, cremation is the obvious cheaper alternative to a burial. But here's the catch. A funeral home must have the signature of next of kin to be able to go forward with a cremation. If a funeral director picks up an unclaimed body and cannot find the next of kin, they can either pay for the burial with the money provided by the state, or they can absorb the rest of the cost or store the body in a refrigerated place in hopes that a family member will eventually turn up. Now, the Department of Transitional Assistance started an incentive program in January 2016 where funeral directors are given an additional $1,000 on top of the $1,100 that DTA provides to remove unclaimed bodies from the medical examiner's office. Prior to this program, bodies were left at the office of the medical examiner morgue for an average of 43.9 days. After the program started, the average length of time from request to removal from the morgue decreased by 8.8 .8 days. That's really not a lot though, is it? When a body is found and does not match any missing persons report, it is suspicious, clearly. There's one local story that stands out to me. On June 25th, 2015, the body of a two-year-old girl was found. She, we learned it was a little girl, had washed up on the shore of a place known as Deer Island in Winthrop. It's actually on the flight path of Logan Airport. Her decomposing body had been submerged in water for some time. The press gave her the name Baby Doe for her small size. There were no clues as to who she was, where she came from, whose child she was, or what had happened that led up to her tiny body being found inside a knotted up trash bag. A woman walking her dog along the beach made that grim discovery. Imagine the terror of finding a dead body. Oh, that would haunt me. While I have a deep interest in crime and strange things that happen, I truly want nothing to do with an actual real life murder. No way. Who would? Unless you're completely fucked in the head for all the wrong reasons. I'm definitely not the bestest friend in the meme. You know, the one so good they'll help you bury a body. Oh, fuck no. This little baby girl, all of two years old, was found in such an awful, tragic way. The chaos of her little soul. And no one was looking for her. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children generated a computer image approximating what the child would look like. In an effort to identify this child, an appeal that went viral worldwide. Flyers were everywhere around the Boston area in eastern Massachusetts. There were billboards. The U.S. Coast Guard even attempted to trace the tie to help solve the case. But none of that led to finding out who this baby was. Before it was finally learned that she was Bella Bond. None of the flyers, billboards, news reports, or coffee shop gossip solved her case, though. It was someone who knew something, who said something. A friend's of her mother and her mother's boyfriend told their probation officer. Hers is a story with many details that I will write about and tell you soon. She does deserve that dignity. Bella and her mother moved into an apartment on Maxwell Street in Dorchester when Bella was about a year old. And soon after, her mother's boyfriend moved in. That boyfriend, he is the one that punched her so hard it ultimately caused her death. There had clearly been other abuse before that day. Baby Bella's lifeless body was put in a refrigerator, then wrapped up in a trash bag and dumped into the harbor at City Point in South Boston, a place where her killer, her mother's boyfriend, Michael McCarthy, knew from growing up in Southie. Then they, McCarthy, and Bella's mother, Rochelle Bond, passed the time after her murder doing coke 
eating pills, shooting heroin, and keeping their mouths shut about what happened to Bella. Baby Bella was born on August 6th, 2012, and died sometime in June before her third birthday. She'd be 10 years old now. She was so beautiful. Big round cheeks, soft brown eyes. Of course, I will share photos on the Crime of the Truest Kind Instagram and on the webpage. It is heartbreaking. The city definitely felt a collective sorrow during that time. Bella is buried in the Winthrop Cemetery in Winthrop, Massachusetts, just under the flight pattern of Logan Airport. And she had been classified as an unidentified decedent and not at all unlike Ruth Marie Terry in Provincetown was. What is different, though, is that Ruth's family had been looking for her. While Bella Bond's identity was learned, and her killers were arrested and sent to prison, Rory Jean Kessinger is still missing. She was 24 when she disappeared on May 27, 1973, after breaking out of the Plymouth County Jail in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And if you are wondering, because I know you might be, there is a Plymouth Rock in downtown Plymouth. It exists with really no fanfare whatsoever. I will recreate my reaction upon seeing it as an adult. I don't remember my reaction as a child. You walk into downtown Plymouth, it's very beautiful, and you look over into where the rock is and you're like, well, there's that. Plymouth is America's hometown, home of the famous Winehorse Beach the gateway to Cape Cod. I learned a lot about it as we were about to move into a new house there last summer. I still get a little bummed we didn't make it to the town. That house, though, not so much. Roy Jean Kessinger was from Pembroke, a town about 20 minutes northwest of Plymouth. She was reportedly last seen by her mother when she was 15. And that's sad. Your 15-year-old daughter goes rogue. I have to wonder why. I wasn't able to find out very much about Rory's family life or why she was a teenage runaway. And I guess that's probably part of the reason why detectives could suspect that the Lady of the Dunes could be Rory Jean Kessinger, who, by the time she was in the Plymouth jail cell, was a 24-year-old gun runner and drug smuggler, allegedly. But that's quite a reputation to uphold, don't you think? Many comparisons of the then unidentified woman who was buried in the Lady of the Dunes plot in Provincetown were made. As technology advanced, investigators tried several times to learn who the woman, now known as Ruth Marie Terry, was. DNA was extracted on several occasions in an effort to find out who the lady was and where Rory Kessinger might be. In 1973, though, a young woman charged with robbery and assault, escaped from the Plymouth County Jail while she was awaiting trial. She had long red auburn hair, similar features, and an athletic build. Is that code for thin? I think it's code for thin. She was Rory Jean Kessinger. Given her similar appearance and her need to lay low after an escape, many in the Provincetown community began to wonder too, was she the woman they found on the beach that day? But... Once DNA analysis became available to forensic scientists, the case drew cold once again. Now, of course, we know it's not her. But Rory Jean Kessinger remains a part of local folklore. No one has reported seeing her since her escape. Was she a not law, a badass? Was she a criminal mastermind? Was she stupidly brave, as one official put it? Is she dead? Was she murdered? Is she alive and living in Sedona? We know she did have aliases. And if I'm close to right, she'd be 73 today. No one knows what happened to Rory Jean Kessinger. She's like the legend of Billie Jean. You know that outlaw movie from the 80s? Where is she? She's everywhere. The legend of Rory Jean. She was a fugitive after all. The little we do know about Rory Jean Kessinger is that she was known to the cops in Southern Massachusetts. Her family hadn't seen or heard from her since about 1964. She was 15 and a runaway. She had a history of drug use and various criminal activity and was said to have several aliases. Jennifer Marie Lynn, Linda Lynn Koch, Penny Susan Johnson. And then she made her jailbreak and went on the lam. She was reportedly wanted in several states like Kansas, California, 
Texas, and Alaska. She has the least amount of available information and reputable news reporting about her life than any story I have done to date. What we know about Rory Kessinger is just the same info that gets repeated with some nuances that are bound to get skewed over time. For 49 years, she has been a mystery. Her father was a loss prevention security director in department stores. Despite the authority he had at work, he couldn't sort out how to deal with his rogue daughter at home. In 1968, after she's run away, according to local lore, Mr. Kessinger wrote a letter to the editor column in the Daily Illinois State Journal, addressing the out-of-hand situation of youths and shoplifting. It read, We in security realize that shoplifting is sometimes brought about by our younger set because of their desire to feel in with friends. Whatever that thing is, kicks derived from theft would no longer be if these same youths were educated as to the consequences a court conviction would have on their young lives. What did she do exactly? In January 1973, Pembroke Police Lieutenant William Bolter encountered Rory when assisting Stoughton police in serving a notice of traffic violation to a home in Pembroke. How does that work exactly, I want to know? You get a moving violation, but later, when you're at home? That seems, uh, how do you say, not right. When the cops showed up, Rory and her crew took off out of the house, through the back door, into the woods. Lieutenant Bolter was able to catch up to Rory after she tripped and fell, making her getaway. She was wearing only lingerie, reportedly, in a very interesting look in Massachusetts in January. Rory claimed she had been raped. Lieutenant Bolter escorted her back to the house, where she attempted to steal his gun. He managed to push her off and call for backup. Then she turned out the lights and slipped into another room. Bolter was able to find the lights, turn them back on, get his bearings, and when he did, there was Rory, waiting with a gun in her hands. And all she said was, I'm sorry, but now I'm gonna have to kill you." After which time he was able to wrestle it away from her, this woman we would call a petite, 5'3", 118 pounds. Well, I guess they would call it petite then too, right? And there is a quote, the cop says this, you would just not think that a nice looking girl like that will kill you in a heartbeat. They got Roy to the hospital, where she pulled out a gun again, this time on a caseworker and another cop yelling, die you fucking pig. All I can imagine is like the Manson family in my head when I hear her say these things, where she was tackled again. There's no question that back in 1973 that she and her cohorts were savage drug users. I'd have to agree that she was high as fuck during these run-ins with the cops. Adrenaline plus courage could equal stupidly brave. Or maybe she was just an outlaw. She was charged with two counts of assault with intent to murder and sent to Plymouth County Jail where she remained awaiting trial. But she hatched a plan. And no one is certain who exactly did what, but Rory broke out on May 27, 1973. Did she coax a prison guard into helping? Because she definitely had help. Rory Kessinger escaped by sawing her way out with a smuggled hacksaw blade. Some of the markings are reportedly still visible in the jail today. And she shimmed out the window by tying bed sheets together and ran into the dark and was never seen or heard from again. We don't know how she pulled it off or who was waiting for her once she got to freedom. But we do know she was running in some very shady circles, probably among the organized crime circuit of the day, among the drug dealers and hoodlums, or hoods, as my mother would call them. One post I read said Rory looked like a sophisticated and worldly James Bond girl, rather than a naive townie. She ran with some tough crowds. Her associates included a man later killed by an FBI agent during a bank robbery, and a man who was an inmate at a federal prison. In 1974, an associate of Rory's was picked up for some crime, and they reported that she was pushing up daisies. That is slang for she is dead. I think you're pretty smart, but I had to clarify. Some people think she was murdered way back then, 
But again, we really don't know. Roy Kessinger could be living among us under one of her many aliases. In 1998, Roy's mother was located with the help of a private investigator in the hopes of verifying the identity or whether the murder victim found in P-Town was her daughter. And as we know now, they were able to finally secure DNA, scientific testing like that was unheard of when this case began. In 2002, samples were taken from the exhumed remains of the Lady of the Dunes, tested against the samples from Rory's mother. And 20 years later, we now know her identity. Imagine what we will know 20 years from now. Rory has not been seen or heard from again since her 1973 jailbreak. And her family, it's said, has not seen her since she was 15 years old. My math says that's 1964. If you have any information regarding the whereabouts of Rory Kessinger, if you know if she's dead or alive or living in Sedona, please contact the Plymouth County Sheriff's Department, 508-830-6200. 33 years ago, Melanie Melanson disappeared in Woburn, a town 12 miles north of Boston. Now I've gotten emails about Melanie's case, one from Melanie's childhood classmate, asking if I'd cover her story, and I have reached out to contacts for more information. If I can speak to someone close to her case, I will. She was a 14-year-old Woburn Memorial High freshman when she vanished on October 27, 1989, while attending a party with friends in the woods behind Henshaw Street Industrial Park. That's off Washington Street near the Stoneham and Winchester lines. She was seen in the woods with two local boys the last people to have been seen with Melanie between 1 a.m. and 4 a.m., neither of which have shared any details that have helped locate her. Both have repeatedly insisted that they have no idea what happened to Melanie Melanson and have stuck to that story. There have been searches in the area where she was last seen. Any leads are followed up on. In 2009, 2020 by ABC News covered Melanie Melanson's case. Jerry Leone, District Attorney of Middlesex County at the time, explains the case and includes the names of two boys who attended the party. One is James Tresca. He was 17 at the time, and he does appear in the episode. The other was someone named Jean Bertini. Both Tresca and Bertini were in the woods where Melanie was last seen. Melanie's family have not been given any information that would lead them to finding her, whether alive or dead. And they say that Tresca's and Bertini's stories have been full of conflicting information. According to the Charlie Project, that profiles cold cases of missing people in the United States, Melanie was last seen by her family on the evening of October 27, 1989, and was last known to be in the company of two boys she knew. Their conflicting stories after her disappearance include each claiming the other had been the last person to see Melanie. One of the boys said he saw her standing at the head of the trail in the early morning hours of October 28th. Melanie did not take any personal belongings with her when she disappeared. Police had originally thought she had run away to Florida. None of Melanie's loved ones have heard from her since October 27th, 1989, 33 years ago. Melanie's family will tell you she was happy at the time of her disappearance. She was looking forward to her upcoming birthday on November 1st, where she would be turning 15. She was about to have her braces taken off, and she was about to transfer to the Vogue in neighboring Wakefield, the Northeast Vocational High School at the time. I think it's now the Northeast Metropolitan Regional Vocational High School. They made it longer. She had a lot to look forward to. No one believes she ran away. Melanie was not living with her parents at the time she disappeared. She was being taken care of by her grandmother and her aunts. There was no evidence that her parents had anything to do with her going missing. And her grandmother has since passed away. In August of 1992, an anonymous phone call to the Woburn police spoke of Melanie's body being in a local pond. Investigators searched the area, but found nothing. No evidence connected to her case at all. Police believe she was the victim of foul play and is still in the vicinity of where she was last seen. Melanie Jo Melanson's case remains unsolved.
there is a Melanie Melanson tip line. Any information is helpful that relates to her disappearance, something overheard, something that might not have made sense at the time could mean something now. Call 1-866-637-4907. You can email melaniemelansontips at gmail.com. All of this information will be posted on the show notes at crimewiththechewiskind.com. The Town of Woburn will hold their 7th Annual Angel of Hope Candlelight Vigil this Tuesday, December 6th at 7 p.m. on Arlington Road in Woburn, Massachusetts. There are so many more missing people in Massachusetts alone. If you read through each New England state's list, then you will know that there is a lot for us to cover. Each of these people deserve full episodes to talk about their lives, the impact of them being gone has had on their families, and what courage it takes to continue to believe that their loved one may come home one day. I began researching unsolved murders in missing people, starting with Massachusetts. I have a very, very long list and so much more to get to. It's just astounding to me how long these families had suffered through not knowing. Teresa Corley, 19, was from Franklin, was found in a ditch along I-95 in Bellingham, Massachusetts in 1978, her case is unsolved. 25-year-old Danielle Oliverio of Quincy was found in a secluded area on Ballard Bale Street in Wilmington on January 29, 2007. She was badly beaten, strangled, and her body was set on fire. According to records, it was possible she was still alive when the fire was set. Her case remains unsolved. Melanie Quadros was last seen walking her Pomeranian named Rusty along Bridge Street in Lowell on January 18, 2010. She was 27 years old. She has never been heard from again, and her dog was never found. Her mother reported her missing a week later. Juan Gonzalez was 22 when he was shot to death on Chandler Street in Worcester on February 10, 2001, with approximately 20 to 30 witnesses no one came forward in his case. He was not believed to be the target of the shooting, but his case remains unsolved. We will feature cases like this throughout the series and throughout the season. I will certainly continue to go in depth with cases and you can continue to send me those. I love when you do that. You can email me at crimeofthetruestkind at gmail.com information about the show crime of the truestkind.com please follow rate and review the show on apple podcasts on spotify and everywhere you listen to podcasts tell your friends about the podcast that is the number one way that's the top way people learn about new true crime podcasts when you people who love it when you the fan who love it and listen to it tell your friends drop a rating five stars are my favorite and review. I love it when you post reviews and tell me how you like the show. Thank you so much. All right. I'll be back in two weeks with a new episode. Thank you for listening. Support the show on Patreon for brand new tiers to keep the show commercial free. And I will send you lovely things in the mail. Until next time, lock your goddamn doors. Goddamn doors.